problem when it comes to Jiro protection, this broad category where we are not targeting diseases specifically, but instead we're targeting the underlying mechanisms of aging, is we can't measure it. We don't have a way to measure it. We really don't have biomarkers for aging, and you've been open about frustrations with that because when you look at geoprotective molecules and you look at if these things are working or not, we really don't know because we don't have those biomarkers. So do you maybe want to talk about that for just a minute to kind of set the stage so when people hear your framing for everything else, I think it will make a little more sense? Yeah, I think one of the most important things to understand when you're using some sort of intervention is do you have a biomarker to know if you're doing it correctly? Think of like really basic things that most people don't even consider as interventions like nutrition. How would you know if you're eating too much? Do you have a biomarker for it? Sure, there are lots. One biomarker might be your weight. Another biomarker might be your waist circumference. Another biomarker might be your insulin level, your glucose level, your average glucose. I mean, you, you, know, you get deeper and deeper down this and you start to realize that how much you eat, you have a way of getting feedback from the system that tells you, do you need to correct this? The same is true for exercise. The same is true for sleep. You know, there might not be a lab value that is specific to sleep, but there are clearly ways to get feedback to know if you're sleeping too much or not sleeping enough. If you think about it through the lens of, you know, taking exogenous molecules, you take a drug like lisinopril, right, an ACE inhibitor for lowering blood pressure. How do you know if you're taking the right amount? Well, you measure your blood pressure. And let's say you get started on a dose of lisinopril when your starting blood pressure was 135 over 85, and all of a sudden it's 115 over 75. That says the drug is working. Are you symptomatic? By the way, that's another biomarker in a sense. No, you're not lightheaded. Great, everybody wins the game. If your blood pressure goes too low and or you're symptomatic, which is probably the bigger issue, then you're taking too much. You have to dial the drug back. If you're taking the drug and your blood pressure comes down but doesn't come down enough, that's more feedback. Dial the drug up. So you have this sort of input-output ability with every drug that we like to think of. Again, the same is true with drugs for diabetes, with drugs for lipids, with you know cancer drugs that you take. You would be able to look and study, is the tumor shrinking? Is the tumor growing? So you have somebody getting feedback. Well, the problem when it comes to Jiro protection, this broad category where we are not targeting diseases specifically, but instead we're targeting the underlying uh, mechanisms of aging, is we can't measure it. We don't have a way to measure it. So we take a drug, we take a supplement that we believe is Jiro protective, and we don't know if it's working. Are we taking enough? Are we taking too much? Maybe if you're really lucky, you might find a side effect that tells you you're taking too much. But do we really want to be in the game of pushing things to the point of seeing overt side effects? So, so that's why I believe as unsexy as the world of diagnostics and biomarkers are, and it is a very, very unsexy world. I mean, this is not a place where people like investing money. This is not a place where there's an enormous amount of uh, capital being thrown at the problem. It is a very important problem, and it's going to be very important in humans if we're interested in studying Jiro protection. And I probably the very first time I went on kind of a long diatribe on this was back when I was really, really obsessed with trying to understand the perfect routine for fasting. And I'm sure you can recall this sort of circa 2018, 2019, 2020. I was very frustrated that as, as much as I was trying to study this in myself and doing every part, every sort of blood analysis under the sun, I had no way of knowing if my my fasting protocol of, you know, seven to 10 days of water only once a quarter, three days, once a month, was that too much? Was that too little? Was that doing anything? Was, I mean, no idea. To this day, I have no idea if that provided any benefit at all. I could certainly point to some negative things it did, right? It cost me probably 20 pounds of muscle over six years, but maybe that was a worthwhile trade-off given some other benefits, but how would I know? don't know what the benefits are, don't know how to measure it. It's a very important problem, and it's one that I, I hope more and more resources will be poured into because otherwise it's going to be very difficult for us to 
kind of move further in understanding what works in humans. And on that, I do actually have another framework question. You've often talked about your analogy of, are you picking up a gold coin or a penny? Are you picking up in front of a train or a tricycle? And oftentimes when I've heard you use this, it's a lot of times as it relates to interventions, specifically drugs and supplements. Do you maybe want to kind of just quickly give people what that framework is? Because I think it is really important based on everything you said, which is a lot of this is kind of a guessing game and we don't really know. So we kind of need to anchor it to another framework to try and figure out what are the risks and what are the potential rewards as we try and figure out within ourselves, what are we willing to do and not do? Yeah, it's it's nothing more than a very simple matrix of risk and reward, which I'm sure anybody would would easily be able to walk themselves through. Um, all I do is just to make it easy to remember, I just put very obvious concrete examples in the corners of the matrix, right? So it doesn't matter which axis is horizontal or vertical, but if you just say that the horizontal axis represents risk going from low to high, and the vertical axis represents reward going from low to high, you would say, okay, at a very extreme level, low risk is bending down in front of an oncoming tricycle. And as you move from left to right on that horizontal axis, it goes to getting in front of a train, you know, jumping in front of a train track and grabbing something and then getting off the train track, right? So that's going from low risk to high risk. And in terms of reward, you would think of a penny being pretty low reward and you'd think of a big, fat, juicy gold coin being very high reward. So as you go from higher risk, you would expect and demand higher reward. So I'll tell you a story. I'm, I'm embarrassed to say this because it speaks to just how stupid teenage boys are and how much of a miracle it is that our species still exists with the utter lack of judgment that um, that exists in, in the presence of young boys. So when I was in high school, one of our favorite games to play was when we would get off the train, we would immediately jump under the train and see who could lay the most coins on the train track and then get out as quickly as possible so that once the train started rolling, you could see how many coins got flattened. Like, just think about the abject stupidity of this game. Another game that was tragically very popular when I was young was playing chicken in front of the subway in Toronto. Who could be the last guy out? And very sadly, the younger brother of one of my friends in high school did not make it out. He was killed by a subway playing a stupid game of chicken. Talk about incredibly high risk for no reward. So how do we apply that to, you know, interventions? And I, I guess we're talking about this through the lens of supplements. Well, I think we have to acknowledge that there's a great uncertainty with many of these things. And therefore we should ask ourselves, like, how can we handicap the risk based on human data, animal data, safety data, efficacy data, as far as reward, and where on that matrix do we place this intervention? So if you're going to take, I don't know, fill in the blank, some fancy supplement that some internet guru is telling you, like he's making with his own proprietary blend of crushed bird feathers and, you know, testicular juice. Okay. I mean, do you want to take that risk? Because it's hard for me to imagine the reward is really there. So, so that's just kind of like one of the things I, I will push my patients on is when they show me their laundry list of supplements, I, I walk them through a framework about thinking through it. And, and one of them is where are you in the risk reward matrix? Mm -hmm.